first thing I'll say is why, why, this, uh, why all the technology, right? Well, so this is, we're trying to do something new with the concept of a conference because we are responding to Jordan Peterson who is fundamentally like an online phenomenon. We thought this conference needs to, if it's responding to him, primarily focus on engaging the internet. So thank you so much for being here in the flesh, but also there are thousands of people joining us not in the flesh tonight and for the rest of all time as long as the internet is functioning. <laughs> it's, not, it's not working though for, uh, for YouTube, but go figure. Oh well, that's okay. Facebook's good. So I'll just say a couple of words about what this conference is for those who did not already know. Then I'll say, well I'll just say this part first. What is New Symbolization Project? New Symbolization Project is a club at Boise State, but we are also um, the people who are working with the Boise DSA um, and a handful of schools and departments here on campus to bring especially Peter Rollins and Richard Wolf, but also we were able to bring podcasts, Symptomatic Redness, The Michael Brooks Show, and Zero Squared, all of whom are in the house right now. And today we already had, Today we had a debate. We started off with a debate on how serious we should, how, how seriously should we take uh, Jordan Peterson, and uh, then we had a bunch of breakout sessions today, as well as a live podcast recording of the anti PC industry, which is this mechanism online that has sh uh, basically been the thing that brought Peterson to this point of cultural prominence. So the way this all started, and I, I can get through this part pretty quickly here. Basically, Douglas Lane from Zero Books had a debate scheduled with Jordan Peterson in January of this year. Uh, Douglas Lane is a self-proclaimed wannabe Marxist. And he wanted to challenge Peterson on this stereotype, sort of scapegoating thing that Peterson like, uh, likes to do, where he says, oh, it's these postmodern, feminist, neo-Marxists that are ruining everything. Right, when he's not talking about self-help, it, 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 or when he is talking about self-help, it tends to be couched in that, right? And so he was just going to have a respectful debate or a conversation where he challenged him on some things. Peterson, I'm not gonna speculate as to why, pulled out of that debate. Then he went a few couple weeks later onto the Joe Rogan show and said that Marxists will not debate him, they will not engage him in dialogue, it fundamentally goes against their ideology. So we thought, what the heck? <laughs> we are the postmodern feminist neo-Marxists on campus at Boise State, and we will not put up <laughs> with this. We would love to engage you in real dialogue, and so would the person who you just canceled on. When one of his fans in a conversation, I don't know, it's one of those Q&A things on Reddit, one of his fans asked him, like, why did this happen? Why did you say that? What, 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 what's going on here? Peterson's response was, Oh, well, Douglas Lane, Zero Books, they're just not very popular, you see. I, we get, like, I get hundreds of requests to debate like every week. <laughs> so that's an evasion of the actual question, right? It's kind of a sidestepping. And so we thought we'll, we would have Douglas Lane come and give a talk in lieu of a debate, which quickly, because Douglas likes to do things with his friends, turned into a whole conference. <laughs> then, when we started you know, saying online that this whole thing was going to happen, and this is my favorite part, all the Peterson fans were like, well, you better invite Peterson to this. And I was like, well, I mean, I, I, that's kind of the point, is that he wouldn't. <laughs> but how, do, how are we gonna invite him now when he already said Douglas isn't popular enough? So then we thought, oh, well, we'll just have to reach out to one of the most popular Marxists, right? And so we reached out to Richard Wolff, one of the most popular Marxists alive today, who said that he would come at cost to debate or speak in lieu of a debate. And so we were able to then reach out to the Peterson people and say, all right, so you wanna set the record straight on this whole thing about how Marxists won't debate or engage you in dialogue, this is your opportunity, right? And so uh, their response to that was not for less than $50,000. We can't afford that. So we're not rich enough we weren't popular enough, then we weren't rich enough. So anyway, we're just trying to do this thing as a response to all that. And 
Now we're here, and I'm so excited to say that we have Peter Rollins in the house who, set, who did a Facebook video on the debate that basically won't happen, that so many people were really excited and hoping would happen, right? So Slavoj Žižek is arguably the most uh, well-known philosopher today alive. And Slavoj Žižek wrote a short little article responding to the sort of cultural phenomenon that is Peterson. And uh, this, this, this resulted in you know, Peterson writing something back and then being like, well, do you want to debate? And then Zizek was like, yeah. And then there was like radio silence for that for a couple of months. And then everyone still, whenever they see this thing online in the comment section, somebody always brings it up like, I still want to see that debate between Zizek and Peterson. But um, a few of us have been in contact with him this year. And I regret to say that he is not in good health. Um, he was very open about this at the conference where some of us were at, at uh, Antonio Garcia's conference, the Zizekian Institute's conference um, earlier this year, where I was able to meet uh, Slavoj. And he, he was very like transparent about how, how things are working out with his health, which is not well. And it's gotten worse. And so this is basically the debate that will never happen. And it's going to leave a lot of people who really wanted it um, desiring. But Peter Rollins' video that he did, or videos that he's done on this, on this fundamental ideological difference between these two people who both take psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis very seriously. Um, I think that he's very good at, at that, and we were all really excited that he was willing to do this. So um, he's the author of The Idolatry of God, the author of The Orthodox Heretic, the author of a lot of other books, and a traveling speaker who's made this thing new religion or um, death of God theology known things. And so like we're all really excited to have him here. Please welcome Peter Rollins. Thank you. Thank you, man. Listen, it's a real a real honor for me to be here. Um, I'm so grateful for Dave and for Doug especially, who were the two people who reached out to invite me to this. Uh, I think this is a really serious and important conversation to have, and so I jumped at the chance to be here, and so I just want to say thank you for that. Um, uh, can you all hear me okay? You might not be able to understand me because of my accent, but if you can hear me, we're halfway there. Uh, I'm not even from Ireland, to be honest. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. I just put this accent on. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody would listen to me. No, so uh, the Northern Irish accent, we talk very fast. I've got a lot of stuff I want to get through, so I'm going to you know, blast through this. Um, another thing, because I'm from Ireland, I want to say Irish, we're, we're lovers, or sorry, we're fighters, not lovers, right? And uh, we love a good fight. You go to Ireland, you go to the pub, you have a drink, you talk to your friends, a couple more drinks, and then you're telling each other that you love each other. And, you know, yes, and if ever anything happens to me, you can have my kids and my life, and it's, oh, you're amazing. A few more drinks, and there's a fist fight. And then at the end, you go, will we do the same thing next week? It's like, same thing next week. So it's kind of like analysis in that kind of way. You fight with your analyst. You shout at them. You say, you're just doing this for the money. You don't care about me. And then Tuesday? OK, see you on Tuesday. Right. So I say that because I want this to generate a fight, a conflict. Uh, I think people on the left are pretty good at conflict. <laughs> we, all, we fight. Um, but there was a famous uh, comedian, Dylan Moran, if you know him from Ireland, he once said, uh, war is not conflict. War is the inability to have conflict. And uh, he said it in a much funnier way. Uh, it was this part of a skit, but I thought that line was beautiful. War is not conflict. War is the inability to have conflict. And uh, you know, he was talking about how whenever you're at war, you don't want to listen to the other, whoever the other is. You just want to kill them. Right? That's it. War is you cannot stand being in the same room with somebody. You want to devastate them and destroy them. That conflict is actually a step forward. Conflict is whenever you're able to sit in the room with somebody you really rather wouldn't, and you can at least start having some kind of dialogue. And you know, there is time for war. There's an example of a, a psychotherapist I was reading who said, this is, a, I think it's a nice example of a family whose child, uh, their son was killed um, in some sort of drug deal gone wrong. And what happened is one of the family friends 
said to them, listen, you know, your son was part of this whole drug network, right? He wasn't an angel. And that person was cut off because in the family's minds that their, their son was a pure, good person who didn't deserve to die. And so they kind of had this, this, this image of their son because they had so much suffering, so much mourning, so much pain inside. But eventually, once uh, some people had been brought to court and uh, once they'd been convicted, and maybe a couple of years later, that relationship was able to be established again. And the family were able to say, well, you know what, our son wasn't an angel. You know, our son was our son, but you know, he did some, he did some things that were wrong. And what happened there is in a sense, the defense mechanism, which was valuable, was a defense against the suffering. Um, they, you know, just like when you break up with somebody and you think the other person is awful and terrible and you're pure and innocent, did nothing wrong, right? That's okay, because that's protecting you against a, a deep suffering, a deep pain. But if you don't lower that defense a little bit, you know, you'll find that you're never really able to move on and have healthier relationships. And you'll never be able to maybe make peace with that person. And if you've got a good friend, the good friend will allow you to say all those terrible things and say that person was terrible, horrible, evil. They won't encourage it and they won't kind of discourage it. They'll, they'll be there. But at, at a certain point, they may hear a little bit of uh, uncertainty in your voice. And at that point, they might say, you know, I, I think you're just really hurt. I think that, you know, this really just took it out of you. And if that's said at the right moment in the right way, the individual might be able to say, well, yeah, you know what? You know, it wasn't all their fault, maybe. Maybe some of it was my fault. And, you know, it wasn't as black and white as I would like it to have been. And it's that little crack that allows for novelty, allows for something else to happen. Even if the other person was mostly an asshole, right? It still opens up a crack where something can happen. And I saw this in Northern Ireland, where I'm from, with the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, after uh, basically 30 years of war, that all sides went, OK, you know what? We're going to get into a room together. And we don't know what's going to happen, but we'll see. All of that to say, I hope that what I say here generates conflict and uh, discussion. Um, you know, I, if you disagree with me, I disagree with myself. So we're all in the same boat. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to argue that uh, uh, Peterson does not take a psychoanalytic perspective. So Peterson actually is more influenced by depth psychology and by Jung. And I'm going to contrast that with a psychoanalytic uh, reading of the contemporary times. And, you know, Shizek is someone who is very key in uh, that uh, psychoanalytic reading. So I'll be kind of referencing him. But uh, I don't want to speak for Shizek because he's much better than I am. But, but what I'm going to say here is very much influenced by Shizek. But before I get started, I want to show you a quick uh, clip from a 1960s TV series called The Prisoner. I don't know, has anybody seen The Prisoner? There you go. That's, it's a classic, one of the best TV shows that was ever made. Um, and I'm going to show you this because I actually think this series gives a really nice summary of a potential way of reading um, the, a con the contemporary uh, uh, political situation um, uh, using psychoanalysis, right? So this is the opening scene of The Prisoner. And basically, every episode starts with this opening sequence. Um, the dialogue at the end is what I want you to think about. It's the dialogue at the end that's the important bit. And it's always a different person who's saying it. It's a dialogue between someone who's called number two. And number two always changes. And between number six. So let's have a look.
formation. Whose side are you on? That would be telling. We want information. 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 So basically, the show uh, is a surrealist um, series that charts the, uh, the life of this secret agent. So the secret agent retires under mysterious circumstances. And he goes back to his house to pack his stuff and to run away. But before he can run away, he's drugged. And he's brought to this place called the village. And when he wakes up, he's given a number, number six. And basically every episode, he is trying to figure out who runs the village, what uh, the, they are looking for from him, and how to escape. So he's ultimately always looking for who is number one, who is the person who runs this. And what's interesting about uh, the prisoner, which is a little bit different from, say, the Star Wars universe, where balance is what's important. You know, imbalance is the problem. Uh, the village is this perfectly balanced idealized, beautiful place. Everything is provided for you from when you're born to when you die. But it is very disturbing and uncanny. And it's ultimately a prison. It's a prison, but no one knows who the prisoners are or who the guards are and whether the guards are actually also prisoners. And number two, uh, it looks like he's or she is as imprisoned as everybody else. And at the very end of this series, we find out who number one is. And it's very, very interesting. And I'm going to give spoilers at the end of this talk, but it came out in the 1960s, so you had your chance to see it. All right, OK. So before I come back to that then, I just want to start by outlining kind of Peterson's uh, kind of views on what you could call maybe identity politics activism. The kind of thing that made him famous was this critique of this type of activist movement. And basically, Peterson argues that uh, Marxism, you'll, you'll mostly know this, Marxism uh, became untenable as a position, uh, really with Stalinism, with the fall of the, the Berlin Wall and the, the end of communism in Russia. And that, uh, that after Stalin, Marxism was no longer an intellectually credible position. Or maybe not even intellectually credible. He might just go, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't a position that you could openly affirm. And he said what happened is uh, certain Marxist intellectuals then kind of started to turn to uh, cultural theory and cultural criticism, you know, the Frankfurt School being one of the main places, where Marxism started to drift into you know, literature, film studies, cultural studies. And uh, some of the, the basics of Marxism, which for Peterson is basically a battle of the oppressed and the oppressor, I'm not going to do lots of asides about where I think Peterson's wrong in this, OK? Because I'm going to try to get to the core issue. This is just Peterson's argument. Uh, Marxism, as an economic and political theory, uh, became untenable, then kind of filtered into a kind of cultural criticism and permeated wider society. And then um, postmodernism kind of took this on. Uh, Postmodernism took on this kind of cultural Marxism, maybe adding a little bit of intellectually respectable nihilism and a little bit of a critique of meta-narratives. Uh, and then this kind of force uh, came across the ocean to America and kind of really threatens to destabilize the Western order, uh, the contemporary Western system. Now, for Peterson, the contemporary Western order isn't perfect. He's not saying that what exists is, is fantastic. But he is saying that there is a certain balance between order and chaos. There's a certain kind of hard-won balance in our legal system, and our judicial systems, and our educational systems. And that this enemy from without, this attack of postmodernism and cultural uh, Marxism threatens to uh, destabilize that 
and kind of like uh, bring us in the wrong direction. So that's kind of like a summary of, I think, Peterson's views of cultural Marxism and postmodernism. And Peterson is very interested in this idea of balance and harmony. So you have this, it's, it's not, you know, he's famous for saying tidy your room, right? But he has also said, well, if your room's too tidy, you should mess it up a bit. Because of course, like if you meet obsessives, obsessives are incredibly tidy. I have an obsessive in my family and his garage is just incredible. <laughs> Everything is so ordered. So too much order can be its own problem. And so what you see uh, in Peterson is this in interest in balance between shadow and light, between uh, order and chaos, between masculine and feminine, between the conscious and the unconscious. And the idea is that uh, it's a fragile balance, right? It's just like walking. One of the examples Peterson uses, is walking is a type of falling, but we don't fall because we're always kind of maintaining a certain balance. But that can be disrupted and then we'll, we'll kind of fall over. Um, so this, this is very influenced by Jung. Uh, Peterson quotes a lot of different philosophers and, and different thinkers. Uh, I think the main one, I, you know, I think he misquotes a lot of philosophy, and uh, he advocates for books like Explaining Postmodernism by Hicks, which are like really bad books. Um, but I think he is a Jungian. I think actually he has read Jung, and he is, he is operating uh, fundamentally from a Jungian perspective. And I think that because um, for Jung, there is this idea of a balance that we uh, need to maintain in our lives. And if we get rid of that balance, problems occur. So in one of uh, Jung's kind of famous essays, uh, The Relation Between the Ego and the Unconscious, he talks about how the unconscious is a type of compensatory mechanism. Uh, whenever we go too far in one direction, the unconscious erupts in the other direction. Uh, one example Jung takes of this is he says there's a guy who's a businessman who thinks his brother's an idiot doesn't like him at all, always belittling his brother. But then in his dreams, his brother is like uh, Napoleon or some great general, right? And the way Jung interprets this is, in a sense, the imbalance of thinking that his brother is completely worthless and rubbish is trying to be compensated for by this unconscious mechanism. So the opposite is happening in the unconscious. And if you don't listen to the unconscious, uh, what happens is that that other side will become like a poltergeist. It will cause damage in, in your life. Now, connected with this is Jung's notion of the collective unconscious. So for Jung, there's two types of unconscious. There's the personal unconscious, uh, which is things within your own life, maybe things you've had to repress that have happened to you. And then there is the collective unconscious. And the collective unconscious is the repository of archetypes and kind of like shared, um, uh, a shared unconscious that all human beings have that is part of the very structure of the mind, part of the structure of the brain. And the religious word for this, Jung says, is the soul. Because the soul, in, in kind of religious terms, is this part of yourself that is also not completely connected to you, that will outlive you, that is kind of eternal, that, um, that, that, that it was there before you were born, will be there after you die. So the soul is something that is in you, is intimate and part of you, but also separate from you, something different. And so Jung says, well, you know, that's a religious way of talking about the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious is this dimension of ourselves um, that, um, that I guess is like this compensatory mechanism. These, 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 these archetypes, so for an example, the masculine has the feminine it, there embedded in the unconscious. The feminine has this masculine embedded somewhere in the unconscious, the anima and the animus, right? And then for Jung, if you cut yourself off, if you cut yourself off from this uh, un collective unconscious, uh, it will cause damage in society and in your family, your individual life. And actually, the way, to, the way to be healthy is to open yourself up to this collective unconscious, 
to these archetypes, to these repressed dimensions of your life. And when you do that and you allow them to speak and you bring them into yourself consciously, then um, you know, it leads to greater health and well-being. So that's basically, you know, ultimately a, a Jungian type of approach, this balance between these, these, these forces. So if you're too masculine and you repress the feminine, um, that will erupt. I mean, maybe an example of if you're so uh, closed off to your emotions and you're, you're, you're always kind of lost in abstraction, and then you will explode in rage occasionally, you know, or something like that. But there is this compensatory dimension. And this actually is why Peterson, I think, is so interested in religious mythology. You'll find that, I like, because I, if, if for this talk, I went through basically most of what Peterson has done, and I realized that the vast majority of it is reflections on religious mythology. I mean, he's got over 30 hours on his podcast looking at the uh, kind of Hebrew scriptures and the stories of those scriptures. And each of these seminars is like two hours long, and they're kind of quite wandering, kind of like you know, explorations of this mythology. And this is, I think, his critique of new atheism. Because Peterson is saying that the royal road to the collective unconscious is religious mythology or mythology. If we want to connect with this collective unconscious, we need to take seriously these religious myths and stories. And um, so I think he's going like, if new atheism, if it, if it cuts itself off from that, it, it's going to lead to some sort of psychic damage, some sort of problems in the future. So Peterson delves into all of these mythologies, all of these stories. And he's not trying to get people to believe in God or anything like that. Um, he's more interested in the God image. Uh, it's, not that the bi it's not an apologetics in the traditional sense. You know, if you listen to his stuff on religion, he's not trying to argue for the existence of God. I think he probably believes in the existence of God. And um, I'll maybe come back to that in a second, but he's not interested. He says, I want you to connect with the God image. I want you to connect with this like almost do uh, an ar archaeological dig into the depths of your being, and there you will find kind of these embedded ideas like uh, the wise individual, the mother, the father, the child, these dimensions. Um, again, this is very Jungian. Uh, Jung uh, gave an example in that paper I mentioned of a young woman that he was working with who was a philosopher. And the background is she had a very, uh, you know, troubled relationship with her father. And uh, she went into philosophy, perhaps partly to escape from the emotional dimension of that, maybe to try to rationalize it or whatever. And then Jung says that as he started to work with this woman, uh, she uh, started to, you know, do transference onto him. So he became a type of father figure uh, to her. Uh, a father and a lover figure. And so Jung says she would dream about Jung. This is very common in analysis. Uh, but she would basically dream of him as being taller than her, being this large figure, or, or being on a mountaintop. And there would be winds blowing around, around him. And so Jung said, OK, this is transference. She is now taking some of that relationship with her father, and she's putting it onto me. And that's kind of abstracting. So you've got your literal father, and now she's abstracting to Jung, who is a type of father figure. But then Jung says, OK, so how did the transference end? How did he break this transference in a positive way? Well, he said that uh, eventually, through interpretation, they got to this idea that, that the winds was God, <clears throat> was this kind of like God-like kind of figure in the background. And so she then abstracted to God. So first of all, she had her concrete father. Then it was the father that was Jung. And finally, she connected with this kind of like perfect father or lover in the unconscious. So it wasn't, he's not moving outwards to some idea of God. He's kind of going inwards to say, this God image says something about, uh, you know, something in the depths of our unconscious. Um, so I th I, the only reason why I think Peterson might argue for the existence of God is he's so amazed that this image exists that it's almost like when Descartes 
uh, Descartes had an argument for the existence of God where he said that we have an idea of God embedded within us. And it's such an incredible idea. Um, it's an idea that's qualitatively different from ourselves that only God could have put it there. You know, you know, cats can't imagine quantum mechanics, right? You know, like you cannot imagine something more than you could than your intellectual ability. And so the notion of God for Descartes is such a a, a massive concept that he kind of argued that maybe God put it there. And I, sometimes when I was, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, when I, because well, Hume's, I think it was Hume's response was basically, well, no, the, the notion of God is not a positive notion. It's a, it's a negative notion. You know, God is infinite as in not finite. So in other words, it's not a, you don't have a positive notion. You have a negative notion. Um, but I think Peterson might say, well, we have this embedded notion of God in our unconscious. And maybe that reflects the ground of being out of which we arose. Because if we arose out of the ground of being, then maybe this deepest abstraction within us reflects something of that ground. But that's not important to him at all. His, his interest in looking at religious mythology is to try to connect people with uh, the collective unconscious. Um, and I think he feels that this, this, is, this will be very, very beneficial. Um, and this is why, you know, whenever you hear him in the Bible, it's all very self-helpy. I mean, he spends hours on, these te on a couple of texts, but part of it is he's trying to get you to walk within it and, and move within it. But everything is kind of like about, you know, standing up straight and uh, tidying your room or making it a bit messy if it's too tidy or whatever. It's all, it's like, it's one bit of self-help after another, <laughs> if, you, if you notice it. Um, uh, it's very, um, it's very unexistential. But... So that's, that's Peterson's kind of view in a nutshell. Now, this, I would argue, is not a psychoanalytic interpretation at all. Now, Peterson has claimed to be a psychoanalyst a number of times. Uh, I've heard him say it explicitly twice. And I, I think it, he is not a psychoanalyst either by training or orientation. Um, not by training in the sense of, and there's a psychoanalyst over there, or training psychoanalyst. But as far as I can tell you, you're a psychoanalyst, you have to be trained by in a particular school of thought for many years and be acknowledged by a psychoanalytic institution. And unless there is a, you know, something slightly different uh, in Canada, he is a clinical psychologist, he's not a psychoanalyst. But when he calls himself a psychoanalyst, I think he means that he is a clinical psychologist who uses some psychoanalysis in his practice. But I don't think that's fair either. Um, I think that what he uses is he uses uh, what we can call depth psychology, but that is not psychoanalysis. I want to make a distinction between those two things. And in order to do that, psychoanalysis, and it gets a bit muddy, right? It gets a bit muddy, but I would say the clearest distinction is psychoanalysis is the theory and the technology that arises from the work of Freud, and primarily his central, I think, insights around the drive theory and the unconscious. There are other therapists who take seriously the unconscious, right? Um, but I wouldn't say are psychoanalysts proper. Uh, and so they also believe in the unconscious, but, um, but it's, it's not in the Freudian way. And I'm not saying that they're wrong or right, I'm just making that distinction. And those would be people like maybe Carl Rogers or uh, Viktor Frankl and Carl Jung. I mean, Carl Jung called himself an analytical psychologist. And so I want to kind of try to tell you what I think the difference is. And the difference is this. In Jung, you have this notion of balance, as I said, between light and shadow, between masculine and feminine, between the conscious, the unconscious, order and chaos. So there are kind of two dimensions that need to oscillate and inform each other and be in a porous relationship with each other. And the unconscious element of that then is a depth dimension. There is deep down underneath the consciousness this other dimension called the unconscious. But I think the, the Freudian insight is that the unconscious isn't some other dimension, some other thing on the other side of consciousness. It's not that there are two things, the conscious and the unconscious, that need to be in relationship with each other, but that the unconscious isn't anything at all. The unconscious is a type of distortion in consciousness. And the way I think about this is actually from an example from back home. Uh, in Northern Ireland, there is a city 
that depending on what you call it, you define yourself as a nationalist or a unionist, right? So it's literally a city that you cannot say the name of the city without defining your political position or at least the political position of your community. So if you call it Derry, you are a nationalist or you're from a nationalist community uh, wanting a united Ireland. And if you call it London Derry, you are unionist and you know, you're part of wanting to keep Northern Ireland part of the United Kingdom. And so interestingly, it's a real dilemma. Well, how do you say the city's name? There's, there's no kind of like neutral way of saying it. And it's all, that's a, that was a problem during the Troubles. If you said the name of the city, you could get beaten up or worse, right? If you said the wrong, the wrong name. And then some people started calling it, and on the news we'd call it Derry stroke Londonderry. That was one way, Derry stroke Londonderry. And then there was a radio host called Jerry Anderson. And Jerry Anderson started calling it Stroke City, right? And uh, I like this, Stroke City. So what he did is he positivized this slash that was, that, was, that was there. Now, this slash doesn't exist in reality. It's the same city, it's, it, it, but it exists within the symbolic. There is, in a way, how you name the city defines your experience of the city. And I think that is a better way to think about the unconscious. The unconscious isn't something in reality that you see Derry and Londonderry, the conscious and the unconscious. The unconscious is the slash that uh, separates Derry from Londonderry. So it's almost like there is matter and then there is a black hole that distorts matter. And that is kind of like the unconscious. Now, that's important because when you take that position, you start to come to very different conclusions. So uh, it brings you to maybe a distinction between the instincts and drive. So very famously, uh, you know, Freud explores and the idea of a drive that is different from instinct, that arises out of instincts but is not reducible to instincts. So what is an instinct? Well, an instinct, you know, we see it in animals, uh, an instinct is for particular objects, like shelter, food, uh, mating, right? So it's got particular, very precise objects. Secondly, you can satisfy an instinct. You eat, you mate, you get shelter, and then you know, satisfy the instinct and that's it. And thirdly, instincts are in the service of life. They extend the detour between two deaths, right? The instincts are are, are part of life. So it's utilitarianism, really. And animals are great utilitarians. They've all read Bentham and Mill, and they all know their <laughs> utilitarianism, you know? Um, it's the problem in, that Freud saw was, hold on a second, human beings are terrible utilitarians. There is something that, that goes wrong, and th we can call this the drive. And the way I think about the drive is in contrast to the instincts, a drive does not have a very narrow set of things that it can be connected to. It can be connected to anything. You can have a drive for, yes, food, and yes, shelter. Uh, you can have money. It can be a drive for new cars. It can, be, it can be stamp collecting, the universal addiction, right? The addiction is so ridiculous that it stands in for all addictions. For gambling, it can be, so you can have a drive for basically anything you can imagine. Secondly, the drive doesn't get satisfied when it gets what it wants. So if you, if you have an instinct for food, well, you'll eat until you're satisfied. If you have a drive for food, you know, you'll eat too much, you'll eat too little, you won't be able to stop yourself eating. A drive, there's no kind of way to see it. The more you kind of move forward, the more you try to grab, the, the, the more you want. So it's this ongoing thing. And then thirdly, the, the drive is not in the service of life. The instinct is in the service of life, but drives get us into all sorts of problems, right? And this is one way of thinking about Ayn Rand. Mishizek says about Ayn Rand, she says that you know, Rand says that capitalism works uh, in the sense of it appeals to our selfishness, right? So, and then you hear this, you go like, you know, regardless of what you think morally about capitalism, the one thing we can all agree on one thing we can all agree on is that it, it appeals to our selfish interests. Um, it's like, so in other sense, it's real. It's very, it's less of an ideology and more of a reflection of our, of our, just, of our natural selfish desires for more of this or more of that. 
And then, of course, the question is, well, can we use this selfish desire in order to, well, maybe benefit more people, right? So that's the problem. But, uh, you know, Shizek says, well, hold on a second. Well, it's, capitalism is very selfless. It's incredibly selfless, um, but, not, but in a perverse way, uh, in the way that a, that a zombie is selfless. Because if you have a zombie coming for you and you start shooting the zombie, it'll just keep coming at you. It won't run away if you've got a shotgun. It won't think about itself. You blow off its leg, it'll still keep coming, right? There's a selflessness to it. It's not thinking about the self until it gets you. Or the alien in Aliens is this other example where this creature that just will go at you until it's dead or you're dead. It, it's this fiercely selfless thing. And so what you find is you'll find some people who, if they were selfish, they would stop making money when they got to 1 million or 10 million or 50 million or 100 million, right? There's a famous footballer from Northern Ireland called George Best. Great guy, but he said once, he said, listen, I spent, I spent most of my money, he made millions, he spent, I spent most of my money on women, drugs, and alcohol. And he says, I squandered the rest, right? Now, <laughs> the, what's interesting about him is he didn't really care about the money, right? Well, you know, he just cared about having a good time. But that's the thing, if you really are selfish, you would stop, but what you do, what do you find in capitalism is you can find this profound selflessness that someone is going to continue to try to get more and more and more for their pleasure, no, because you can say to them, well, you know, like, is this good for your family? No, it's terrible, is it good for your health? No, my doctor says I'm going to have a heart attack probably, you know, you, you know how, much is, how much is enough? And it just goes like, it's insatiable, it's this insatiable drive. There's nothing natural about that, you don't see animals doing that, right? Animals, you know, they, they forage, and when they have enough, they stop. That is the drive. It's like gambling as well. It's like this, this continual wanting more and more and more. And I don't, I don't know if I want to get into this bit, but it is very important, is that what are we addicted to in the drive? Um, in a way, you could say we're addicted to precisely not getting what we want. So, and it's kind of like, the, and it's the difference between pleasure and enjoyment, right? Pleasure, you can define as the, the, the joy you get from having something, getting a cup of coffee in the morning, getting the, the, the present that you wanted. And enjoyment could be described as the pleasure of not getting what you want. So, at Christmas, uh, you, the, the kid is so excited about Christmas, but also having a temper tantrum and wetting herself and all of this, and well, I, can't, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. That's enjoyment, right? Not getting the present. And then the pleasure is opening the present. And that's, you know, that doesn't last for very long. You get the present and you throw it away. Um, and in a way, there's a sense of this, this weird pleasure of, of, not, of not getting. And you could say that, uh, actually, uh, here's a good example, uh, uh, a personal example, actually, when I was in psychoanalysis um, and I was in a relationship and I said to this, the analyst, I said, you know, um, I'm just addicted, it's like a heroin relationship. Um, and um, it's just like I'm addicted to the highs. I'm addicted to the highs. And my analyst just said one thing, he said, maybe you're addicted to the lows. I was like, oh, that was interesting. I was addicted to the highs, maybe I was addicted to the lows. Because the lows continued the fantasy in my head that the high would really work. In gambling, perhaps people are not addicted to winning. They're actually addicted to losing. Because in the losing, the fantasy of winning becomes even more incredible, even more amazing. If you won the slot machines all the time, you'd get bored, right? Okay, you'd get money, but it wouldn't fix the existential angst in your life, right? So it's actually weirdly the losing that generates this excessive desire for some sort of win. I've just finished uh, shooting a short film called Making Love. And it's kind of an exploration of this. And it's called Making Love because you might, you probably know this, but making love was not something two people did. You know, two people didn't make love. You needed a third person to make love. You know, you bring a chaperone on a date and people think the role of the chaperone is to two, stop two people doing anything untoward. But no, the role of the chaperone is to get you to start fantasizing about what you could do if only they weren't there to stop you, right? So the chaperone was literally making love creating the, the excessive desire. It's interesting, as an aside, coming to America, I was fascinated that in America, uh, middle America, you had created a technology to help young people have sex. 
And I thought, this is really interesting. Late 20th century in a permissive society. And it's a, it's a, straight, it's a wee device. It's basically you put it on your finger, and it's called a purity ring. And what happens is you put this purity ring on your finger, and you really want to have sex. Because the purity ring is a ring that says you will not have sex, right? So teenagers put this ring on to say, I will stay pure, and I won't have sex until I'm married. Well, what a way to make sex exciting, right? What a, and I think there are statistics that say people with purity rings have more sex than people without. But it makes sense anyway. Um, if you don't want your kids to have sex, talk about it all the time. Be open. Where did they touch you? Where, what did, whoa, here's a diagram. Show me exactly what happened. That will put them off sex for life, right? Um, yeah. It's the example of, you know, if you've got a kid who, and they want a puppy, and you go, uh, they, well, I want a puppy. You go, you can't have a puppy. And they go, I really want a puppy. As soon as you start saying no, they start really wanting the puppy. I really want a puppy, 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 right? Eventually, you know, you're like, okay, okay, it'll go, I'll feed it every day, I'll walk it every day, it'll be wonderful, right? And you buy the puppy, and then what happens? Three weeks later, they don't walk it, they don't feed it, you have to drown it in the bath, right? So, the, uh, I had a traumatic childhood. Uh, the, 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 the very prohibition, the not getting, kind of creates this fantasy of, of the getting. So the whole thing in Freud, from what I can see, is that, that Subjectivity doesn't split us between two concrete dimensions. Uh, subjectivity is the split between something and nothing. We are, we are marked by a radical lack at the core of our being. And that lack generates a type of desire for something to fill that lack. We start to fantasize about what could take away that lack that is at the core of our being. I mean, this is a very basic way of reading the Oedipus complex, but um, I, I think it's, it's, it's relatively accurate, potentially. But, you know, Oedipus wants to sleep with his mom, perfectly normal. As fa father's in the way, he breaks through the prohibition, sleeps with his mother. He thinks it's going to be a blessing, but it's a disaster, right? Which is basically, you know, if you take these as symbols, the mother is a symbol of wholeness, completeness, oceanic oneness, return to the womb, whatever. The father is the the symbol of the prohibition, what's get, what gets in the way of that. And Oedipus breaks through the prohibition, gets the thing that he wants, and it's a disaster. And in this story, you've got two positions. Depression, because you renounce the thing that you really want, or melancholy, because you get it, right? As Oscar Wilde said, there's only one thing worse than not getting what you want, is getting what you want, right? That's the, 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 the getting. And then you have to repeat the, the uh, transgression to keep the, the dream alive. So you have that basic structure. Interestingly, in all of Peterson's discussions on the Bible, and he spent hours on uh, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, never once did he see the, the obvious psychoanalytic dimension. It's exactly the same as you've got Adam and Eve, you've got a prohibition, and behind the prohibition you've got a fruit tree. And Adam and Eve, they hear a voice, a serpent, that says, you eat of that tree, you will be like God. You will lack the lack. You will be whole and complete. They break through the prohibition, thinking it's going to be a blessing, and it's a disaster. In psychoanalysis, you have the superego telling you, you know, you have to do X, Y, or Z, and then you'll be happy. And in, in the biblical text, you've got the serpent. Same kind of structure. <laughs> um, so there's a, there is a psychoanalytic way of reading the whole text. It's not, it's not in there at all, uh, in Peterson's readings. So... You have then in Freud this idea that there is a lack. We try to fill that lack. Uh, it's similar to Schopenhauer, right? Who Schopenhauer in his more optimistic moments said that we oscillate between pain and boredom. The boredom of getting what you want and the suffering of not, right? That's what it is to be human, to oscillate between these two dimensions. And there is no balance. There is no way to balance that. There is no way to find this order. Um, we, we do not get what we want, even when we get it. That's why, by the way, people ask, why do people go to prosperity churches? Well, oh, because they think it works. Well, if that was the case, then if you showed evidence of why it didn't work, then they would stop going. But if, as most of us know, that generally doesn't happen. If you have someone who's going to a prosperity church, and then you say, listen, here's the statistics. Nobody's getting rich off this uh, at any different rate from the wider community. And yet, weirdly, it doesn't seem to have any effect. Why is it? Well, one reason might be that um, by the very failure is what it causes us to be addicted to it. The very not getting the, the wealth is the very thing that keeps us fantasizing that if we did get it, it would be amazing. 
the actual failure of the system would be if it worked. Because if it worked, you would find out that, yeah, you know, money can get you a nicer shower and a comfier bed, but it, it doesn't get rid of the trauma that's existence itself, right? So it's actually weirdly, we're addicted to the failure because it keeps this fantasy alive. René Girard beautifully said once, he said, imagine there is a man uh, in a rocky field and he's told that there is a treasure under one of the rocks and he's lifting up all of these different rocks, not finding anything. Gerard says eventually he will seek out a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it. In other words, what is more traumatic would be realizing that there is nothing that can fulfill that lack. That's more traumatic um, than the idea that I'll just never find it. That we'd rather keep that fantasy alive than experience the loss of that very fantasy structure. Now then, in relation to all of that, then how do we look at something like capitalism and, uh, and the contemporary situation? For, for Peterson, the, the explosion of protest that we can call identity uh, politics activism, right? He sees it as an external enemy that is threatening to destabilize the current order. But I think a more psychoanalytic reading is to maybe say that it is the symptom of the disavowed violence that is within the order. Um, and a good example of this comes from a friend who's a, who is a clinical psychologist. He's not afraid of somebody I met years ago, but he told me this. He said, I was working with this kid who was wetting the bed and uh, I was using cognitive uh, you know, therapy on this kid. But he said very quickly, he said, I started to realize that, that I think this bed wedding has got something to do with uh, the wider family. So when the kid was brought to therapy, it was basically this bed wedding is causing a potential disturbance. It's, going, it's threatening to destabilize the harmony of the family. And then the psychologist started to go, no, hold on a second. Maybe the bedwetting is the disavowed disharmony that exists already within the family. So it is the symptom. It's not the problem. It's the solution to the problem. The, the, the way to avoid a confrontation with the disharmony and the problems within the family is, is it becomes this concrete symptom that can then be dealt with. And as we all know, if you deal with symptoms like problems, then if you get rid of the problem, something else will arise. So alcoholism is a good example. If you have someone who's drinking too much, right, and they are able to stop drinking by sheer force of will, but they're not able to see what the drinking is kind of a solution to, what the problem is in their life, they're going to do something even worse. I've seen this. I live in Los Angeles. Have you heard of CrossFit? It's terrible. <laughs> Honestly, one day you're drinking too much, the next day you're flipping tires. It's horrific. Never happened to the Irish. But um, so the symptom, in, instead of it being some sort of external enemy threatening to destabilize the order, it is the symptom that is concrete manifestation of a disavowed uh, uh, problem within the order. It's, it's the same with like homelessness or prison population. In, in religious terms, uh, people think that if I go and do prison ministry, I am kind of good news. I'm kind of like God to those people. I'm going out there and doing good work. I'm good news to the poor. But what if, in a sense, no, they are good news to us. They are God. They are the prophet to us. In other words, the prison population is the symptom of a, a disavowed violence and problem within our society. And the, the concrete manifestation of that problem is you know, a prison population that we can lock away and do all sorts of things to. Or again, the homeless population. The reason for going and working with the homeless is not because we are good news to them, but because they are good news to us. If we can listen to why that population exists, what's going on, it will help us see and grasp something that's going on within, within our structure. So coming back then, and this I'll kind of draw to a close, uh, to the prisoner. What's interesting about the prisoner is, right, this guy, the, you heard the opening dialogue, uh, how does it go? He says, uh, where am I? You're in the village. Uh, What's the, what's the dialogue? Where am I? What do you want? Information. Um, who are you? 
That would be telling. We want information. You won't get it. By hook or by crook, we will. Who are you? I am number two. Who is number one? <laughs> you are number six. Right. So that's the, that's the dialogue. At the very end, the last episode, he's, he's constantly trying to escape. He's constantly protesting this system. He's constantly trying to fight it. Eventually, he's in the boils of the village, and he's confronted with number one. And number one is wearing a gorilla mask. And eventually, he comes along, and he rips off the gorilla mask, and he sees who number one is. And it's him. And you realize they've been telling you this from day one. Every single episode tells you the answer. Who are you? I am number two. Who is number one? You are number six, right? Every single, hiding in plain sight. Every single episode starts by telling you that number six is number one. In other words, that the protest and the order are enmeshed, completely enmeshed. So what happens then at the very end? Well, when he realizes this, that, because here's the, here's the potential problem. This may be the controversial bit, I don't know. Um, the potential problem is a system that is trying to disavow its violence and its lack. That lack manifests itself concretely in some sort of form, in some sort of protest. Now that protest is not a protest against the system. In a sense, it wants what it can't have. So whenever, you know, the more you try to get the lost object, the thing that will fill the lack, and the more you can't do it, eventually you will seek uh, obstacles that you cannot pass, and you will hysterically almost demand that object. And so weirdly, the protest and the system are, are kind of wanting the same thing. This is, there's a great story from Northern Ireland, very quickly, but it's about this IRA guy called Seamus, right? And Seamus dies and he goes to heaven. And he's outside the pearly gates. And now, one of the techniques of the IRA at the time was to plant incendiary devices in buildings. Uh, and then they'd phone the police, you know, and they'd say, you've got like five minutes to get out, 10 minutes to get out. This happened all the time, right? So anyway, Seamus gets up to heaven. He's standing there. Eventually, St. Peter comes out with a big, dusty book, sets it down, opens it up. And he looks down the book, and he says, listen, Seamus, he says, your name's not in the book. You're not getting in. And Seamus says, oh, no, no. He says, you misunderstand. He says, I'm not trying to get in. You've got five minutes to get out, right? Now, <laughs> what I like about this story is within, say, conservative religion, Right? The idea is Christianity is universal, it's for everybody, but only a few people get in to the balance and the order into heaven. Right? Then the, the liberal tradition is the message is for everybody, and hey, everybody gets in. Right? But the radical theology says, no, 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 the job isn't to get in, the job is to get everybody out. The absolute needs to be in the grit and grime of the world. The balance and order of heaven is hell. That is the very problem, right? So it's not getting everybody in, it's that we all identify as the outsider. We all, in some sense, break out of this desire for that wholeness, completeness, that purity, satisfaction, all of that. That is the problem itself. What if that the mechanism that keeps capitalism running is precisely a mechanism of desire, a mechanism in which more, 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 we want, we want, we want, and there's never any way to satisfy that. We want this in, and uh, you know, the conservatives potentially are saying, well, not everybody gets in, right? Not everybody gets to the table. And then the protest says, no, everybody should get to the table. But I think the left should be saying, no, we need to overturn the table. There's something problematic about that very structure. This is the Camus rebel, right? Camus says the difference between the rebel and the conservative and the revolutionary is the conservative and the revolutionary kind of, one wants the system the way it is, one's imagining a, a utopia the way it could be, whereas the rebel directly enjoys being the outsider. They direct, so the, the revolutionary is upset and unhappy until they get the utopia, and then if they get it, they're usually killed by it, right? But the, re the, the rebel, the rebel is weirdly the one who can directly identify with the struggle itself, directly uh, create a community that is outside of this system of desire. It's the wild one. If you've seen the wild one, the classic movie, the ultimate rebel, where um, Mildred says to Johnny, who's in the uh, black uh, rebel motorcycle club, says, Johnny, what are you rebelling against? And Johnny looks at her and says, what do you got? 
right? You can see the enjoyment. Johnny is finding a way to live outside of the system and to enjoy that outsider position. And actually, to potential, that can be a revolutionary thing. One example, I'm sorry, and then I will stop, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, I think like, again, this is a religious example. I work a lot within the religious world. But, uh, you know, the gay marriage was a big thing. Where, well, it's not, it's not religious, it's everywhere. It's gay, gay marriage, you know, and it's, you know, should gay people be allowed to marry, right? And th within the church, but this was a kind of an idea of should this community that's been excluded from this institution be able to participate in it? And I think that's great, absolutely, and, and uh, yeah, great. But the more interesting question is what could the church learn about how to do relationships from this community that has been excluded and actually has maybe in, uh, find other ways to do relationships that might actually be able to teach us. So instead of bringing the other in, we in a sense go, no, maybe actually they will have something to say about how problem, like, the whole, you know, you've heard it before, like let gay people get married so they can be as unhappy as the rest of us, right? <laughs> you know, but yeah, that's the, the problem is like marriage probably is in a bit of a crisis. So can we set up communities that somehow enjoy kind of being on the outside of this, of this structure and what does that look like? In Christianity, radical theology, I think it's called salvation. In psychoanalysis, I think it's called the cure. And politically, this form of breaking free from the, this death drive towards the lost object, I think can be called socialism. I think it's a different modality of desire. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and uh, see if we've got any time for questions before we go and have drinks. Do we have any time for questions now? We've got like 15 minutes. 15 yeah. minutes. Oh, shucks. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. I see a hand at the very back and at the very front. So that's a bit of exercise for you. You're going to, we'll definitely get to you. But there's a microphone, so wait for the mic. Oh, Daniel. Sure. So my question is in the context of being an analyst and an organizer operating in the Deep South, when you were speaking of protest in the system being embedded, and I'm going to give away my epigraph from my presentation for tomorrow. Yeah. What comes to mind is Lacan's statement, revolutionaries, what you aspire to as a master. You will get one. You'll get one. Yeah. And so that being said, I, I like how you articulated this notion of not getting in, but actually getting out. Yes. And so with this notion of circularity that we're seeing, I think we can think of Foucault, where there is resistance, there is power operating in that circular modality. So my question is, in, within the, the context of your ministry, what are some concrete steps that you're taking in terms of getting out? Okay, yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, you can articulate this in a, in, a, in a tweet, which is, it's great to live in a society where we are free to pursue what we will, will make us happy, but we need spaces where we are freed from the pursuit of what will make us happy. That's a very Shizekian thing. You know, what does it mean to have a collective that is not simply free to pursue what will make us happy, this frenetic drive, but what does it look like to create a structure that is freed from that pursuit? Because I think that is the micro society of resistance. That's a, and that's why I work, that's one of the reasons why I work within churches, by the way, because <laughs> there's all of these groups that meet every week and do liturgical practices. And so if you can just change slightly how that's done, you've got a lot of people, right? So I'm interested in a type of liturgical structure where people meet every week, just like in therapy, maybe three times a week, where we engage in certain liturgies that enact this type of freedom um, almost uh, performatively. Like what, what uh, Hack and Bay would call a TAS moment, a temporary autonomous zone. This little moment in your life where we, uh, that's where flash mobs came from, you know, this idea of the TAS. You do something that is, you know, it's momentary, it's, a, it's an aroma of a different way of being, and before the police can arrest everybody, it's gone, right? So it's a big street party, it's a massive pillow fight, uh, you know, in, in, the t in the town hall, whatever it is. Um, so concretely, how do you do it? I think that, that I, that's what I, that's, I almost, it's difficult to talk about because that's my whole work, is, is trying to create these, these institutions. But we did talk about it, like, in Christianity, the central ritual is the Last Supper which is uh, eating around the death of God. It is a meal that is structured where the community gathers over a shared loss, a shared death of God. Um, I'm also interested in Burning Man. 
Because Burning Man, no matter how kind of new agey and druggy it is, and uh, as Dan, you were saying, there's like a lot of rich people <laughs> going to party in the desert and wear uh, 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 Mad Max clothes for a week. But there is actually something very powerful at the center of, of Burning Man, and it is that the central ritual is where you get together over the loss of something, the destruction of something. We even have one in Northern Ireland where on the 12th of July, we build bonfires that are five stories high all across the city and set fire to them. And uh, it's this weird shared ritual. It's a very um, sectarian ritual, so it's not a good one, but it is a weirdly where a group of people are bound together, not by what they share, but by a shared lack. So, and, and this is where I'm very Shizeki and in my theology is I think that that Christianity can be interpreted as, oh, I see your hand, I will come to you. Well, as long as he sees your hand, that's okay. The, the, the um, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, the, uh, uh, thank you, someone's listening, gold star for you. You get the hymn book. Um, so Christianity can be interpreted as a kind of a liturgical practice that brings people into the death of God. And that's what conversion is. For me, conversion is not an addition, not a new set of beliefs. I actually had a conversion when I was 17, crazy, like a really weird kind of thing. And I came home to my parents and I said, I'm no longer your son. They're like drinking their gin and tonics going, that's weird. And then I got rid of my stuff. I threw out all my stuff and I stopped going to tech. Now, where I was doing computer studies, I go like, what was going on there? And then I became a total fundamentalist for a while. But what was happening? Well, weirdly, I didn't have any way to articulate it, but I just momentarily felt that that when I said to my parents, I'm no longer your son, I was kind of saying, all of the way you brought me up, good as it was, wonderful as it was, but as a Northern Ireland, kind of Protestant, whatever, that just doesn't have any operative power anymore. And when I got rid of my stuff, it wasn't a St. Francis of Assisi moment. It wasn't that I'm so good, I'm going to get rid of my stuff. I just looked at my stuff. And it was, um, your stuff is often a representation of what you value. And I just looked at it, and I just didn't value any of it anymore. So I got rid of it, and I stopped going to tech, which is what I was doing to get a job. I kind of thought I had to get a job and do X, Y, and Z, and suddenly I felt I didn't have to do that. And there was this moment where nothing was added to my life, just something was radically taken away from it. And because we're liturgical creatures, I believe that we can have liturgical enactments of that loss. One example, sorry, and then we'll move on, is atheism for Lent, which I do every year, which is now grown to, I have thousands of people who participate. And atheism for Lent is really where uh, mostly theists, but not always, but do read and reflect on different atheist thinkers for 40 days. Every day is a different reflection, a different podcast, a different reading. And this, this is a Lenten experience, because you know, well, you want to give up chocolate, fine, or marzipan, or TV, well, why not give up God for Lent? That's kind of cool. Um, and the idea is that actually you discover that this is a really good way to hit the, the moment when Christ cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? What better way to get to that cry on the cross than do 40 days of reading the best critiques of religion and Christianity? And the argument is that this is not anti-Christian. This is actually a liturgy or a ritual that can help people experience this, this, this loss. I get talk for it. I'll stop, I'll stop. I'll stop. Good. Somebody else. Okay, so um, I'm gonna like hystericize your Zizeki and ontology for a moment. Absolutely. Um, so I consider myself. Take the mic off her. Take the mic off her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I consider myself a very orthodox Lacanian to the point that I reject Zizek and I reject Hegel. I prefer to read him through Quentin Miasu and Elijah Brower's intuitionistic mathematics. And something that really bothers me, I think, about a lot of even Badiou's interpretation of Lacan. Like you said before, you were talking about the opposition between something and nothing, and that I feel like there's ac that's actually very, I guess, mechanical or like I don't know how exactly to put this, but it's like Brewer talks about the distinction between actual and potential infinity, and what I guess like I feel like there's this danger in seeing the unconscious as like a kind of like actual nothing, that there's this idea of an actual nothing that. I think is actually very, very death drive. That it's sort of very like it's like a fantasy of wholeness or like the other side of wholeness. Whereas what Brower advocates rather than an actual infinity is a potential infinity. And I, I relate this, I, I would see this as similar to the way Lacan talks about the, the feminine not all, uh, or even desire as distinct from drive, the way Kantami Yasu talks about hyper chaos. Um, I feel like, you know, when you connect those sorts of threads, it stops being, it stops making sense to say, 
to talk about nothing or the void as like something that is is actual and not like you know virtual would be another word for it or potential like absolute potentiality contingency and all of that and so that that's sort of just like a little little thing I throw out relatedly I'm much more interested in Christian mysticism uh, like Hildegard von Bingen and Simone Weil more so than the Hegelian Protestant theology that Zizek likes to praise I have a lot of issues with that related to the same topic but I just wanted to throw that out there and I'm curious like if you have any response to that no, I really appreciate that. I'd love to talk more about it because I could learn a lot from you. I mean, what, can I ask you, like, what did you think of the example? I'll, I'll give you my mic, don't worry. Because um, I would really be, would be interested in teasing this out, but the example I used of Derry, London Derry, and the stroke, like, would, how, how did you like or dislike that as a, as a way of interpreting? Oh, there's another as a way of interpreting what? The unconscious. The unconscious. As no, as I think that was really good. I think, I guess, like, what is interesting about that is that it's kind of like the gap between two different, like, symbolic formations. Like, it's the gap between, like, where, like, on the one side you have an attempt of, it's like discourses, it's like a master signifier. Like, the master signifiers are different, the terms of the discourse are different, the structure is different. And, like, in that gap, I feel like that's definitely where, like, the real starts to come in, like what's ineffable, what's sort of impossible to like actually land on, what kind of like pushes you between the two and doesn't actually stabilize. Um, so I think I think that's a great example of like how like when you get really deep down into the core of any diff any given discourse, like what you get to is like splits like that. That like well, like it's not just one thing. Like like you were saying this wonderful thing before it reminds me of Mayus's rejection of the principle of sufficient reason. There's not a like grand reason underlying all of being. And the most rational thing to say is actually that there's no grand reason that actually uh, being is purely contingent, has no reason for its existence whatsoever, um, and that that is traumatic, but that's also the kind of truth that would allow us to really uh, embrace our desire more effectively. Cool. Well, listen, I w I w I'm going to pretend I got an amazing answer, but I wouldn't have time to say it. <laughs> uh, I w what, I, what I will, hope if we get a chance to talk, I would like to know... Where yeah, where your you think the concerns are? Because I'd be fascinated to hear that. So let's talk about that. Like this type of the Zizekian approach, I think you're saying that you hear there's a worry that that goes this death drive. There's something very negative. So I'd like to hear that from you at some point. Go for it. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I figured uh, I'd go into a uh, kind of dealing with how do we both escape the system and the signifier. I'll stand up so people can see me better without having to look back as much. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Baudrillard. Baudrillard, in his uh, book, The Transparency of Evil, the first essay after the orgy, he discusses how, in fact, we're actually already living in utopia. And we just refuse to recognize it. And I've always found that uh, closely correlates with, uh, in the Bible, when Christ says, well, no, heaven's on earth. You just aren't realizing that. Uh, you know, heaven is around us. So when we're finding this new symbolic order in the world around us, how do we push people out of heaven and out of the search for heaven and instead into a world that no longer looks for heaven and that no longer relates itself in accordance to heaven? Because in theory, heaven has to exist for there to be a rejection of heaven. Okay, that's like, I'll, I'll kind of approach... I'll say something inspired by what you said, but it probably won't directly, you know, respond to it. But basically, you know, for me, heaven is a type of fantasy that is created between the pleasure principle and the reality principle. So obviously, very simply, uh, you know, Freud has the pleasure principle is I want to climb trees, I want to eat chocolate, I want to win all the games that I play. And the reality principle is your body won't let you climb trees when you're a kid, your mom won't let you eat all the chocolate you want, and your friends won't let you win all the games that you want to play. And so what we think is we think the reality principle is getting in the way of our pleasure. And so we start to fantasize of having pure pleasure principle without reality principle. Or there's the, uh, another way to resolve it is pure reality principle, like get rid of desire. So I think religions tend towards r pleasure principle or reality principle. They tend towards either promising that you can have pleasure without reality in this life or the next, or to renounce desire and get rid of that. I'm arguing for uh, a religion of the absurd, uh, so a kind of a more Kierkegaardian kind of thing, which is uh, a religion that directly embraces um, the 
contradiction because of course it's the reality principle that gives you pleasure if you if you just got everything you wanted pure heaven without reality principle it'd be pure hell as a which is a perfect example is the horror film from the 1970s you see about the the crazy guy who's who's torturing this kid in this vast building you know willy wonka and the chocolate factory right where where at the very end they're in the wonka vader and he says he actually tells you know charlie the truth briefly the devil he says remember what happened to the kid who got everything he ever wanted. And he says it in this very ominous way. And Charlie says, what happened? And then in this evil smile, he says he lives happily ever after. Right? And I love that. Because if you've seen The Twilight Zone, there's one about this guy, Rocky Valentine, who's this, um, this uh, uh, low-life criminal. right? And he's, he's ripping off this diamond store, gets shot, and he, come, he wakes up. And there's this guy in a white suit called Pip, who's right standing over him and says, oh, how are you doing? The guy's like, I'm okay. He says, takes out his gun, says, who are you? He says, my name's Pip. He says, give me your money. And Pip laughs. He says, here, you have my wallet. I'll give you more than that. Come back, come with me. So they go to this mansion and he says, where's your money? He says, well, open that drawer. Opens the drawer, there's millions. He says, it's not, it's not my money, it's your money. This is your place. He says, I hear, Rocky, you like, uh, you like gambling. Let's go see some gambling. They go to the, you know, the casino, and, and Rocky Valentine wins every single time. And he's like, this is the afterlife, oh my goodness. He says, I don't think I should be here. But he keeps it quiet. And of course, you know what's going to happen. But eventually, Pip leaves. And six months later, uh, Rocky Valentine calls up Pip, says, I'm going crazy. I'm going absolutely crazy. I can't stand this. I shouldn't even be in heaven. I should be in hell. And of course, Pip turns around and says, whatever gave you the impression that you're in heaven, this is hell. And then it's like Rocky Valentine is condemned to live happily ever after, right? Is the, is the Twilight Zone. And it's that, that notion that actually pleasure without the reality principle is hell. And somehow um, it is the, uh, the embrace of the split itself, which I think is what the crucifixion is. It's where the highest God dies by the lowest. So to wear the cross is to wear an, literally an absurdist symbol. Um, it's to embrace this uh, it's to, to embrace enjoyment, the, the enjoyment of not getting what you want, of the eternal struggle until you die. I think that's what salvation is. Uh, but I don't know if that's, that's not an answer to any of your questions, but I can't do that. I'm a politician, I'll just answer whatever I want, whatever I'm thinking. But you did have your hand up, maybe we should do one more. Uh, this guy has, oh, you as well, whoever. Yeah, Jacob was gonna go, and I, I just, I like to do this one thing when oh, we yeah. get to this point where we just let a couple people oh, say yes, their thing, yes, and yes. then you synthesize and close out. That's, that's yeah. great, yeah, yeah. I was about to suggest that. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Um, so radical theology has been criticized um, by elements of political theology um, and Afro-pessimism for uh, being a white boys club, really. Um, and this pertains to uh, like Zizek and your work as well. Um, but I'm wondering if your notion of the death of God, if you feel there's any resonance with, um, say, James Cone's idea of the death of God, if God is white, kill God, or with, with say, Afro-pessimism, if you see that there's any sort of resonance there that could sort of bridge that gap um, that would deal with that criticism of radical theology. Was it Kenneth? Have the other one? Yes, um, how do you regard um, Jordan Peterson's use or, myth use or misuse of the mythos? Isn't he doing what Joseph Campbell has done before? Um, to engage in a little bit of conflict, since you said you wanted some. Um, I knew that was coming from you, by the way, <laughs> right from the start. That's good. I got, I got your number. I saw it earlier in the debate. Um, but in all seriousness, um, there's an irony to a conversation like this that requires uh, almost a liturgical knowledge of, of a thought system to even engage in. And we're also trying to talk to people who don't have a grasp of that. Um, how do you bridge that gap consistently? And I actually wanted to congratulate you because I think usually you do. So it's. <laughs> I like the way you say usually, as a not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, and I don't know that 
that the average, and it's not a matter of intellect, but I don't know that people would even know where we're coming from exactly when we talk this way. That's a great question. And if you want to see these two talk about new religion and Jordan Peterson's Christianity, that's tomorrow at 12.45, special podcast live. Yeah. Was there one last one? Okay. I don't see a hand. All right. Close okay. it out. Very quickly then. I'll go to you, sir. What was your name? Jacob. Hey, Jacob. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would say, because I think that's a legitimate critique, so the last thing I want to do is, I mean, probably the first thing I want to do is get rid of all critique, but, um, but really, that's a very legitimate thing to say. The only thing I want to say to this, and it will actually connect with something that you mentioned, um, is that I, so I came to radical theology late, genuinely. Like I, I, before I became a writer, uh, and before I published, and before I came to America, um, I did a thing called ICON for 10 years in Belfast. And it was a community in this bar called the Menagerie. It was this IRA bar. Um, and I remember asking the guy, Francie, uh, who's later put in prison because there was a big arms dump in the place, but uh, uh, can I do something in your bar? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I said, what is it? And I said, well, it's kind of like this weird kind of religious thing, but not, and we'll just do it around people. And he was like, yeah, okay, you're on next week. And we didn't know what it was going to be, and that's how it started. And, you know, uh, Kierkegaard says, life is lived forwards and understood backwards, right? And, you know, Hegel, the Isle of Minerva. Um, we started doing stuff, I was not knowing what we were doing, and then people would ask me to justify it, so I would make stuff up. And then the stuff I made up, some of it I was like, that sounds quite good, I'm gonna have to remember that, right? So the theory kind of really came out of this praxis. That's not completely true, because I also started my PhD. So there was this theory and praxis kind of movement. But, but we did this thing called ICON for like about 10 years, and then I started, and it was probably Shizek was the first person in the, the radical Lacanian tradition that I started reading. And I was like, oh, I like this stuff. And it was interesting that you know, he came from a, a, you know, a former Soviet uh, satellite. And I thought, oh, th this, this is coming from a place of like real grit. And then in, in Belfast, we were coming out of the conflict as we were set up ICON really just in the aftermath of the Good Friday Agreement. And so for me, this radical theology always had this radical political dimension. Um, and it was only later that I started you know, writing and then speaking and then being, became lazy. You know, I don't do much now, I just do this kind of stuff, you know, and then drink, right? But the early days, I, what attracted me to radical theology was genuinely its political dimension. And it was only when I came to America that I started you know, getting that thing of like, yeah, you know, you're a white guy, yeah, who's like, you know, doing this thing, going around speaking and getting speaking fees. And, well, like, yeah, no, totally, I admit that, but, but really, I was working with artists and musicians and activists in Belfast. We were creating this thing, and they wouldn't even let me speak for more than five minutes at any event, because otherwise I would do this, right? And so there was, um, I, so it's, not, it's just going like this, the, the, my, my kind of flavor of radical theology grew out of the troubles. And so it grew out of like, uh, out of a real political conflict um, that actually res semi-resolved itself. I mean, we disbanded our police force. There was the RUC, right, it was the police force. Um, we, we said they were over to, overly militarized and over sectarian. As part of the, the, the Northern Ireland peace process, we disbanded our entire police force and set up a new police force. It's quite an incredible story. Um, and so, and so that, that's where I cut my teeth. And, and so I want to argue that, that actually I do think that this has real political teeth. But maybe in America, it's not where it's going to be at. Maybe it will be somewhere else. Oh, and, and, and what was your name again? Sorry. Derek. Derek. Thank you, Derek. Um, uh, that, just relating to that, in ICON, as I said, they wouldn't let me speak for more than five minutes. And the in, in, lovely thing about ICON was it really was, I'll be honest, there was, most of the people who went to ICON were educated to some level, but, but not, not, not necessarily to university level. And um, there was a whole range of, of different people, and there were Protestants and Catholics. And we struggled to put this into music and art. And so here's a, like the, our, a poet friend of mine, Padre Gutuma, who was part of ICON. Like he wrote a benediction for ICON, and it goes like this. The task, oh, because by the way, it's based on the Catholic mass, which ends, go in peace, right? So Padre Gutuma wrote this. The task has ended, go in pieces. Our faith has been rear-ended, certainty amended, and something might be mended that we didn't know was torn. And we are fire, 
bright burning fire, turning from the higher places from which we fell, emptying ourselves into the hell in which we'll find our loving and beloved mother, brother, sister, father, friends. And so, friends, the task has ended. Go in pieces to see and feel your world. Or we did this, it was funny, somebody, they set up a, a, a gathering on, on the second coming. And uh, we had a special guest coming and these musicians. And we were waiting for them. We got set up and everyone came in and said, listen, we're, we're about to start. You know, just give us five minutes. And then we were setting up and all the projectors were being set up. And come up and go like, listen, we're still, we're still waiting for someone to arrive. You know? And then the musicians did a sound check. And of course, we're still waiting for someone. We're still waiting for someone. And then what happened is we very gradually, people realized the event not happening was the event happening. The idea, <laughs> right, of the, of the not happening. And so we, we had, this first time the speaker said, I've been invited to, and not to speak. So we literally invited a big speaker just to sit there. <laughs> uh, and um, so we were trying to find various ways to express this in liturgical form. Um, and, and I think that's vital. And it, you don't see it in my work now, because I'm a speaker now, but, but I need to get back to what we did in Icon. It really was about how do we live this stuff out that doesn't require, you know, so, like a PhD in some obscure French philosopher. And then to the question of mythology, and I think, yes, I think Peterson is doing what Joseph Campbell's doing. He's very Jungian, there's that Campbell thing. I'm kind of critical of that move, because here's the thing, Peterson also calls himself an existentialist. He says he has an existential reading of the Bible, but it, I, I think he must just mean that he tries to read the Bible in a way that's relevant to your existence, because it's not existential. Because like, if you think about an existentialist reading of the text, you think of Kierkegaard, right? And Kierkegaard ridiculed pastors who tried to make stories like Abraham and Isaac into self-help, tried to make them reasonable and a story about how to be nicer to your mum, right? That was his whole thing. He said, the whole thing is anti. He said, the, you could call Jesus anything. Call him whatever you want, but never call him wise and never call him ethical, right? Because in one sense, there is a teleological suspension of the ethical. There's something about the biblical text that is fundamentally destabilizing. And so I worry that all of the readings of mythology that you see happening is it's a kind of way of rendering, taking the absurd out of, out of Christianity. When I have a much more Kierkegaardian kind of approach, which is, you know, to show how, I mean, the crucifixion is the most absurd thing, the highest dying by the lowest. There's this, because like, the absurd, I think, the absurd in music is punk, right? It's, it, it's an eruption of, that's not music. In art, is Dadaism or surrealism. In pol politics, it's maybe Occupy. It's like these moments and these interventions that fundamentally de destabilize the order. And that, I think is, is the uh, Shoa within the Jewish community is the events that cannot be rationalized, cannot be made sense of. As soon as you put reason on it, it becomes offensive. Oh, it's because of the sins of the people, it's because of this or because of that. And I think the crucifixion is the ultimate uh, punk. It's the ultimate um, absurdist symbol. And Tertullian says it, I believe precisely because it is absurd. Um, anyway, sorry, that's, that's probably us. I've, I've kept you long enough, we should drink. <laughs> Thank you.